Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that is Bad Alchemy, currently creating the mind-bending RPG Brain Duster, which we'll be getting into. In the red corner, we have a illustrator and designer known as Barry Brunner, a man, a man fr from the New York area, and no Mets jokes, please, he's probably heard them all. <laughs> and in the blue corner, we have Mr. The, the man formerly known as JCD. Welcome from Minnesota. I gotta get at least one Prince joke a week. <laughs> How you two doing today? Or tonight, technically? Pretty good. Doing great. Yeah, I, I know it'd be tempting to do to to do a to do a um Yankees joke, but too easy. And I can. <laughs> I and I mean, I mean, if you're gonna root for one, you gotta root for the Mets. You're rooting for oh, one. Oh yeah. Useless. Oh. Yeah. I just I I I usually just end up laughing at the Yankees. Most and mo and their fan base because anytime they end up being absolute crap, they they act like it's the worst situation in the worst scenario in baseball. And <laughs> given how, given the years of that team lording over everybody, I have no sympathy. Oh yeah, I just kind of um ignore it except for when I hang out with my um my wife's in-laws who are all from Boston and then that's the only time I root for the Yankees. <laughs> as as somebody who has plenty of friends who are mass holes, I can understand <laughs> that. It's the same reason I, I have the same attitude with the Bruins. Yeah. Uh, they they're fine people. They're <laughs> they're truly fine people. Fine people, but um I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> in other words, everybody gets roasted because I believe in equality. <laughs> For sure. And besides, I usually I usually focus all my attend my roasting of the Mets on July first every year. <laughs> you know, Bobby Bonilla Day. No, oh, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> that, that's still that's still go. That's still going to be going on for another 12 years. <laughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't suited up since the 2000s, and he's still getting paid. <laughs> hey, it's the, it's the best deal ever. He gets, he gets, he gets $1.7 million every July 1st, and they have to keep writing that check until 2035. What a deal. He's been he's been getting that deal since 2011, I think. I think it just it just go it just goes up with um inf with inflation. I think it started at less than a million, and then it just went up a little bit more every year. <laughs> nice job if you can get it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, the last time he was asked about it, he said he said he completely forgot because he was busy um ha he was busy having a barbecue with his kids. <laughs> And then somebody brought up, so it was like, oh, yeah, that, oh, that's still a thing. But I suppose it, I suppose the best place to start is the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, respectively, and what made it stick? Oh, you want to go first, Barry? Sure. Well... <clears throat> I, like a, a few other people, found themselves um, without a whole lot of things to do come 2020. Um, so, um, and then um, and then Jake kept on bugging me about these games that he was into. And uh, he kind of started dragging me in, and we started playing, like, um, we started, first started playing D&D. &D, then we started playing a lot more uh, indie games, like uh, Into the Odd and some others. And... From there, like, just got totally immersed into this kind of, like, whole, like, um, RPG world. Um, and just, like, what possibilities there are in there. Mm -hmm. 
And I know Jake's been into it for a little bit longer than I have. Yeah. I started playing 5e with a couple of coworkers. Uh, that's like the first time it stuck. When I was a kid, I grew up, I'm older, I guess. Barry and I are both older, but... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, like, the satanic panic was happening when I was a child, and I got... I got uh, I believe it was probably second edition, because it was about the time that 2 e came out. Uh, and one of my teachers told my parents that it was satanics. So I couldn't keep it. But I played Hero Quest when I was a kid, which is a shitty game. It was a knockoff of D&D. And then I didn't play... Wait, you talking smack about Hero Quest? I mean, sorry. <laughs> it's not a great game. <laughs> well, if you're comparing it to full-on D&D, maybe, but it's... <laughs> but... <laughs> Like, what is the what is the current RPG that people are playing now? Uh, Gloomhaven. It's kind of like yeah, like it, late, it is. Yeah, it yeah. is like that. But comparing Hero Quest to D anD D is a kind of apples and oranges thing. So I mean, that's a, fair. That is of, fair. That one is of fair. them is a is a dungeon a, a dungeon crawl board game, and the other one is well an RPG. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hero Quest is the gate was the gateway drug for a lot of people, so. It's yeah, weird. no, I okay, yeah, so no shade. I played it a lot. I very much enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't I didn't get back into tabletop until like the mid 2010s. Uh, I played some 5e and then moved on. Mm -hmm. And th and since you said move on, I'm get I'm guessing you've jumped around between a bunch of different systems since well uh, well we'll co we'll cover that in a minute when it comes to brain duster. Yeah, I mean, like, well, Barry and I play almost weekly, and, like, I think the system we play sort of shifts. We, we take turns running it. We have, like, a good a good table, you know. It's, like, good people, a lot of fun. Uh, and we've done Delta Green. We've done a lot of, like, old-school D&D. Uh, the last thing I ran was with Swords and Wizardry. Uh, the last game we played, I think, was Call of Cthulhu. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, who lost their sand check the most? <laughs> <laughs> um, it might have been. I, yeah. Who was it, Barry? I don't know. I, I actually came out okay, I think. Although, um, I, I stuck to my character and I was in love with fish people. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but, uh, I don't think anybody like, totally, like, lost it on that one. It was kind of a short, um, Short campaign, but I'm sure if we kept on going, we would have really lost it. It's beginning to look a lot like fishmen <laughs> everywhere <laughs> you go. Pretty much, yeah. That was that was a fun uh, fun character to play. His name was Pierre, and he was a marine biologist who was uh, in love with the uh, the sea, literally. Now, when you say literally, there are a lot of ways I could take that. Oh, yes. He was literally in love with the sea, sea creatures. He was really just looking for love, but just in the wrong places. I'm not singing that. <laughs> <laughs> but with that with that in mind, that bring that brings us to Brain Duster. So how did the idea how did the idea of doing this very, I guess, psychedelic kind of kind of RPG come to fruition. Well, so we were kind of starting to develop a few different ideas, and um, we kind of started way too big, which as you do, and then we just kind of like shrank it down. We're like, all right, we're going to just do an adventure here. And um, but one thing I kind of think is always fun in. Um, in adventures is sometimes when you get thrown a curveball and like um, sometimes your characters sort of lose autonomy to a degree and they kind of have to roll with it. And so I thought it'd be fun to like, if they kind of got like a um, bike with something sort of psychedelic and they had some sort of affliction that they, uh, the characters are supposed to believe that they must play into. Um, and then we just kind of built an adventure based off of that. And would you say that the, would you say that this is an because you de you describe it as an RPG but but 
You also describe it as compatible with most game systems. Would you dis- would you say that Brain Duster is a standalone RPG? Is it one is it one that's a module that can work with a bunch of systems that's system agnostic? Where does where on the spectrum does it fall into that, or is it both? It's it's definitely not a standalone RPG. It's uh it needs to be well. I mean, if you run like super rules like stuff, and you 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 need a framework to to put it in. Uh, but it, it's like a module. It's like an adventure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, since this is referred to as a psychedelic RPG, psychedelia is is certainly a. It is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but I think a lot of people um, aren't the most consistent regarding what it actually means. And when dealing with what sort of adventure something is, I th- I think that's important. So. For the sake for the sake of it, um, how would you two define psychedelia, just in terms of a just in terms of a visual style and the like? Um, I mean, I think psychedelia really can be up to an interpretation, but I generally think it's usually something that's like a little bit warped, a little bit like your mind is. Um, not seeing things as you should, whether that has um, been enhanced by some sort of substance or just the where your headspace is, um, you know. And you know, we have great history from like whether it's like you can go back to say something like um, like Alice in Wonderland could be something considered to be extremely psychedelic, or like just kind of like nineteen sixties rock and roll. Um, but like and then also just like visually like it's a a lot of times it's just things that sometimes have um are a little bit of askew um whether that is just like your perspective or like um just like colors that shouldn't be there shapes that shouldn't be there or like just something that's like a little dreamlike even Mm -hmm. yeah and i i'm aware that it could be interpretive but (laughs) obviously there had to be one direction you got you guys leaned into when <laughs> built, when building it, this kind of thing because it's not uh, because well, no matter how many lanes there are, you can only pick one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, a central conceit of this is that your characters are dosed and their their perception of reality is altered, right? So um, there's a table for that, uh, and you know it's like. Your the players are encouraged to lean into it, um, and uh, uh, so I think like an altered state is sort of core to the psychedelia of this. Yeah, I know it would be tempting to to say, "Oh, it's oh, it's what happens when you're when someone's on a bad trip." Well, it's kind of hard to go in, to go into that without ha- and. With when um, somebody well isn't on something, uh, I mean, <laughs> maybe if you've never had the experience, you it, it doesn't like hit the same way. But I mean, I I don't know. I mean, like I think uh, the the effects can be sort of played at the table in a way that is fun. And like that echoes the the experience, uh, uh, even if you, well, I don't know, I don't know, even if you have not ever uh, had a psychedelic experience. I mean, for me personally, I could see myself um, using using music from from like um, graveyard or the or the sword to help people kind of get a feel for things. I think that would be a that would be very fitting. Um, yeah, I think just there's tons of psychedelic rock and roll that can really like um, kind of put you in that mindset. Mm. Um, I also think too, it's like if you've like never really had any of those uh, experiences personally, you, I think you can pull off of just like your own like experiences. Whether there's just like if just sort of like something that's very dreamlike, where you're in like a world that is. I just altered to some degree where it's just something doesn't make sense. And you can really just pull off of that from like, you know, everybody has 
a wacky dreams to a degree of like whether they look down and they're not wearing any clothes or they're like something is way too big um or something like that mm -hmm. and with that with that in mind the con as from what i understand the conceit is that the player characters are on this mi on this mind bending affair where they um, are trying to fi are trying to um, go through the experience to get their way out of it so they can have their um, sanity. Um, I don't know, Barry. You want to give the the quick rundown of the yeah? So yeah, yeah, yeah. They um, and so essentially, the party, the players, they all kind of get spiked in the beginning of this adventure by um by this uh, sort of like barren mad scientist type character who um they're trying to seek out and then from there after they are like spiked and you know some everybody has their afflictions that are, they are given they have to like go through um essentially a hex crawl to try to find um the uh the mad scientist type character at the end um in which then hopefully they will like uh, get their afflictions fixed um and uh, somehow find a reward or something like that is that about uh what anything to add to that jake no i think that's i think that's that's good uh yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and the it's it sounds like one of the main places that people are going to be exploring is the what you refer to as the dazed glade. Uh, and looking at some of the photos on the Kickstarter, I get the feeling it's well not well not as expansive as as some full on West Marches affair, but it is leaning a little bit into a hex crawl. Is that accurate? Yeah. So there's a there's a it's there are twenty key locations, right? Uh, and you can like if you do it. We run it a couple of ways, right? When we were doing our play tests, you can uh, you can run it in a, as a one shot if you want. Mm -hmm. You might have to adjust the layout of the hexes so that when you're at like the two hour thirty minute mark or wh whatever it is, thirty minutes before you're done, they stumble into the final location, which is totally fine. You know, that's what a one shot is. Yeah. Uh, but you could spend two or three sessions going through each of the uh, locations. Um, and it, it really depends on like how how your players are. Like if people dig into stuff, there's you know there's there's stuff there to dig into. Yeah. So it it sounds it sounds like there is a certain destination, but there's a lot of ways to get to that destination. Is that accurate? Yeah. 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 To put it another way, all roads may lead to Rome, but there's a lot of roads to Rome. Yeah. At least sure. uh, as many as there are paths on the, the, the hex map. <laughs> <laughs> and given, given that, do you... A psychedel psychedelic is something that's very easy to convey visually, but I could see it being a bit tricky to convey... Um, in a in a narrative sense, from the GM's perspective, so do you do you in the book plan on putting some advice on some of the some tips to kind of get that feel down for so that the GM can convey it to the players? Um, yeah, there, there's like some tips, especially like early on, as far as like um, um trying to make your players adhere to their affliction. Like if they, for example, like one of the afflictions is like a, uh, you have a gaping mouth that, that opens up on your chest and, um, and it like speaks and needs to be fed. And so if you're, if the player ignores that, it's like, uh, we suggest that like, you know, you'll take like one, uh, hit point of damage if they ignore it. Cause the, the hand the, or the, um, the mouth will start gnawing on your fingers and things like that. So there will be consequences if they don't like um, kind of fall into like what 
the um, what is going on in the world around them. But overall, it's like a, some, a lot of it is up to interpretation. But uh, Jake, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think uh, uh, you know it, it's like it would be important for the GM not to treat the sort of like hallucinations. I don't want to say lightly, but like just like you know, get everyone to buy into it. That's like that's like the the sort of core of uh, of this adventure. So, like, if you can get your party to like lean into like you know, what would their character do if uh, you know a second head sprouted from their shoulder and it was their mother sort of uh, you know telling them that they were inadequate in various ways. Um, you know, and like, you know, encourage and reward uh, <laughs> a player for whatever they can do in that situation, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And given that afflictions and hallucinations is talked about on the book, uh, with, hallucin with hallucinations... I'm guessing you have you have some random tables for both as well as how to kind of improvise what some of them might look like for to um, tailor make them for the table. Yeah, there there is we have some like tables for like the affliction and then like like each of the hexes like has like a um, pretty good detailed description of what's going on and then and on top of that we have also like encounters which uh, with detailing what kind of creature or sort of um, sort of like NPC type weird thing is going to be coming at you whether that's like a wall that's like kind of made out of um, meat and like eyeballs and blinking that you can't go past um or uh, what else do we have in here? Um, or just kind of like some weird like trickery of like of like some weird animals that you would encounter in the woods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and give especially give that certainly makes sense, especially since you look at a lot of fairy tales and a lot of mythologies there's always strange and we and weird and dangerous things within the woods <laughs> I mean, half, yes. half of the fairy tales we all grew up on have something happening in the deep forest yeah doubly so depending on what culture you are and tri you're from and triply so if you're from any culture in eastern europe <laughs> <laughs> oh yes i mean You've probably read the Brothers Grimm at least once. Oh yeah, I never saw the movie. It, <laughs> I never saw the movie. I don't it think I did either. Entertaining. I mean, if you're on a flight and they're showing like <laughs> mid offs movies. Oh yeah, I I know the feeling of being stuck of being stuck on a flight. especially well I, I have the problem of being too damn tall for most for most airlines <laughs> so I've I have to fly in I have to find like business class or something just so I can get some damn leg room <laughs> and ev and even with and even with that well you know all, you know all those jokes about airline food I've heard a few even in first class that that still applies. No matter what class you're in, airline food sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Although at the very least, it's the one case where some where somebody's offered me chocolate and I haven't gotten mad because how are they going to know? <laughs> <laughs> like, normally that'd be a death sentence, but it. But how's how's the flight attendant going to know that that I'm allergic without asking? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the only time I wanted um, airplane food was when I was starving and had a five-hour flight, and then they ran out of meals. Yeah, because Murphy's Law works that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there was a good Samaritan who gave me his cookie. 
which was um and and then the flight attendant gave me um some beers so all i had was a chocolate chip cookie and two beers and i felt disgusting so you probably slept though (laughs) Uh, no, I didn't, because I was all like, I had too much sugar at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you were asking, uh, like, so you, you you asked a question about, like, visual representation. I, I'm, I'm not sure. If, we're not trying to dodge your question. Yeah. Uh, but maybe you could, like, uh, what 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 are you looking for? What I, meant by, what, what I meant yeah. by that is... Something like, something like psychedelia is very easy to represent visually. Yeah. But obvious, obviously, the amount of visual representation you're going to have at a table is limited. Yeah. Oh, I mean, ev- even if even if you, no matter whether or not you're using a virtual tabletop or using a full-on table, the ways that you have to visualize what's in front of the party as a GM is going to have a ceiling. Yeah. And. Uh... The question that I had is, how is how do you guys, from from your own perspectives as both as both GMs and players and play testers of this, how do you present that that particular psychedelia um, when it comes when it comes to what the what the party members will, are supposed to be seeing in those in that psychedelia um, without using without using a full on visual cue. I think there's um, like a few um, like encounters or environments that we've like created in here that are kind of very visual oriented. However, there's also a few like a lot of things are kind of just more very situational in the sense that they're like very absurd. Um, and so the kind of where the like the visual of the psychedelia doesn't really like um go through but like the absurdity of the situation kind of makes up for like something that would be a a a visual encounter um if that makes sense would you agree with that jake yeah i would say like uh we i mean the module's like it's a it, it it doesn't it doesn't lean on this sort of visual experience a visual psychedelic experience. It's a it's an adventure module that you know if you if you if you take a step back, it's it's more or less it's more or less straightforward. You know, you're not gonna like. I mean, I guess you could dose your table and be like, "Haha, there was acid <laughs> in the beer that you just drank," right? But <laughs> like, I, uh, I would I would love to hear if somebody does that. And please don't do that. Experience. We do not agree. Don't do that. that. Don't do <laughs> but that. But I would love to hear about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but I mean, like, so, uh, the, uh, the sort of psychedelic experience is opt in, I guess. And, you know, uh, like there's, there's art in here that sort of like echoes, uh, psychedelic art, but it's not a bunch of fractal stuff, you know, uh, it, it's, it's sort of like face melting and et cetera. Um, so, uh, I would say if you're looking for specifically a game that like leans on into, uh, or, or an adventure that leans into like the sort of like visual experience of psychedelia, uh, this probably isn't it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And obviously it's, like I said, it's something that's going to be, tr- that no matter what is going to be tricky to, to, to convey at first. But given given that given that, um, I know that you guys have this set up as a as a system agnostic affair. Yep. But are there and are there any systems you are there any systems that you guys have personally tested it with? Just do you you just yes. use as examples and what and were there any um any imp- um, you had to do you had to do to get it to work or did it work really smoothly? Uh, so uh, I would say anything that is based off of uh, old school Dungeons and Dragons, and by that I mean like BX, like any, anything that you know has six character attributes and has a notion of hit dice, you can run this with uh, easily. We've run it 
I believe I personally have run it with Worlds Without Number, Knave, and Swords of Wizardry, or or O D and D, right? Did we do uh, uh, old? Did we do old school essentials? I'm not sure we ran. I mean, if you uh, like, we we definitely did O D and D. So if you can do like, yeah, it, it's uh, old school like B X and O D and D are like you know, you can run them. You can run adventures for them essentially the same. Uh, it's an old school adventure. The encounters are not balanced. Like if you stick a stick in the eye of the wrong thing in here, it could be a TPK, right? And like that's just part of it. Um, yeah. So uh, you could run it in 5e, um, but like uh, that's fine. I think uh, I, I don't know, but there's not a lot of tools there. Like the stat blocks are pretty sparse, right? It's like a skeleton that walks, one hit dice, has a sword, like armor is leather, you know? Um, so you have to be, you, you have to be uh, pretty uh, quick on your feet, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't used to that sort of thing. I can, I, I can see it. And given that, do you have do you, since you mentioned encounters and the possibility of TBK, are there certain um, descriptions of monsters that you have, or would it, would um would the choice of monsters ultimately be a DM call? We give we have a, a I don't know if we call it a beast Jerry or if we just have like encounter I forget what we're calling it. We have like it, it, a list. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say. I would say it's more of an encounter list rather than a bestiary because there's there's a lot of things in there that would not I would not consider like a creature or like so, uh, something like that. But like um, we do have like kind of a, a good list of uh, and descriptions of what some of these things you would encounter would be. Um, and like, let's see. but yeah. Uh... You can cut cut back in in a second, Barry. Uh, I just I would also just add like the goal is for this to be like standalone. Like you don't need to like add something to it. But of course, if you see something in it and you want to change it out for something that you like better, that's awesome because like that's what you should be doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now. With that, with that said, what would you get? What would you guys be shooting for as far as a page count? So right now we're like kind of hovering around, I would say, twenty five ish pages. Um, but um, as we're like, uh, it, the book essentially is like designed and done. However, like. Um, we're shooting to have it like ready to be shipped out in uh, in March, but um, before then, I'm gonna like uh, really hunker down, and we're going to probably get it to be about thirty pages long. I think. Mm -hmm. And as far as the release window, what are you shooting for for that? I think we're gonna have it like done, done, um, probably by the end of January. Um, maybe um, that's probably yeah. That sounds about right to me because we're gonna have to get it to the printer by then. <laughs> yeah, and like when it like uh, the ship date is early March, correct, Barry? Yeah, early mid March. Um, I think our, our printer is gonna take about a month to get everything back to us. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I can I can certainly get behind that. And with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you two for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Of course, man. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> As it should be.
Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>